Okay, so building bridges, a brief introduction for people who haven't heard me, and then I want to get into some other things. Oh, the microphone, after I told the other person. So it is being recorded, so watch your language. Um, so uh, how, many how many centennial staters do we have here? That would be people from Colorado. <laughs> Recently, apparently. Um, recognize this bridge? Oh, the porch. Yeah, about two and a half hours south of here. So in any case, building bridges to regenerate public health. Disclosures, I have none to give. Um, I'm not here getting paid. My advocacy work is my own thing. I do, however, feel like I should say that I'm an advocate for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction and for ruminant animal agriculture. Um, I've worked in forage agriculture for most of my adult life, currently work for a forage seed company. If we need definitions for any of those terms, I'm happy to come back to it, but let's keep going. Oh, by the way, this was one of my uh, bucket list <coughs> items when I got to stand underneath the sign that says Ballersted in Ballersted, Germany and take the picture. <laughs> um, I've known about that town since like 73 and finally got to visit. Uh, it's gotten a whole lot easier to get there than it was in 73. Um, so like many, I've had my own personal health journey, right? Most of us get here either by watching someone's or having our own. So, you know, here is the Christmas picture where you set up the camera on the tripod, hit the timer, run in, take the picture, look at it, wonder what's wrong with the picture, the camera. <laughs> and so then, uh, 2007, I finally got serious, uh, found Protein Power Life Plan by Michael and Mary Dan Eads, followed that more or less, and then in 2010, there I am, and here I am in 2023. I would like to suggest that this diet is sustainable. But this experience, um, you know, you may remember that there was a book called Good Calories, Bad Calories that came out about that 2007 time. My wife is the kind of person that is responsible. She will go to the library and check out a book. If I want to read a book, I order it from Amazon. It took her three times to read Good Calories, Bad Calories. I just bought the dang thing, you know, because she had to keep taking it back. It was a short loan. There's one of many differences between my wife and myself. Um, but yeah, I got angry. I got angry because what had been done, I got angry because the industry that I have been taught to serve has been demonized and vilified by people who have not served us well. They blame the results of their advice on the products of ruminant animal agriculture. I don't think that was very nice. Uh, so like I say, I got mad, but then I got over it and said, what can I do that's useful? So my background is I'm trained in the subjects of healthy soils and healthy plants. That's agronomy. And specifically forage agronomy are those plants that are going to be grazed or eaten by animals. And so I know a bit as a result of my ruminant animal nutrition background to know about what it takes to produce healthy animals. Um, and I can contrast a functional scientific discipline called animal nutrition with something called human nutrition. And there's tremendous differences and I'd be happy to go into those differences. But then, obviously healthy people. And there's interactions in between all of these. So I started calling this effort grass-based health. Because ruminant animal agriculture is grass-based regardless of how the animals are finished. All right? So if anybody wonders about that, we can talk about that. But I started that and my hope is that I can be encouraging. My hope is I can give you some pieces of information that will help you answer the criticisms that come back at you whenever you talk to somebody about adopting a, and then fill in the diet description. If it involves eating animal source foods, we know that there are various arguments that are going to come against us. Many people here can answer some of them quite authoritatively. Um, and then my role is to talk about the food system issues, the environmental issues, the management issues. And I've been looking more and more into the sustainability issues. And I think we have the best story going, but we're really bad at telling it. If this were a scientific issue, it would be done. We'd be on to doing other things that humanity must solve in order to meet the needs of mid-century. 
It clearly isn't. The evidence is really clear. There's something else going on. Okay. So the first lesson I'd like to tell you is if you're in this process of restoring your mental, your emotional, your physical health on a diet that is heavier on animal source foods than recommended, please don't listen to the voices that sold you the diet that made you sick in the first place. It's really, really important for us to understand that those voices have been involved in this from the very beginning. They're not honest enough to come forward and say, no, you know, basically we hate humans. And they do. If you're not aware of that, again, I'm happy to talk about it. And I wish they would be honest enough because then we could have an honest conversation. But we're not having that on. We're talking about something else, the whack-a-mole game. And I'm here to say that whatever these arguments are against the production and consumption of animal source foods, taken as a whole look like a really strong rope, but if we can tease that rope apart and test each one of those strands objectively, their arguments fail. But how do we get better at communicating that information? So one of the things I'd like to get, if I'm not too long-winded, is your suggestions about what pieces of information would be most useful? What forms of that information would be most useful? How can we do, make more progress? How can we build bridges? We need to stop building silos and start building lighthouses. How do we get about doing that? The good news is that we can have healthy people and healthy soils thanks to ruminant animal agriculture. I've given presentations on this subject. We don't have time to go into all that. Happy to talk about it, as you might imagine. I'm happy to talk any time. Um, but if you look at the data, there's this tremendous urban-rural divide in terms of metabolic health. I mean, we're all familiar with the dismal performance of public health recommendations in terms of avoiding obesity. It doesn't seem like we're doing a very good job. And then, of course, all the conditions that are related to that. But there's a significantly higher rate of these conditions in rural areas than there are in urban areas. So since I'm trained to serve industries that are primarily rural, that's of interest. And maybe that's part of the bridge building. How do we get this message from this kind of a model of convention into you know, the best Western in Bismarck, not to say anything bad about Bismarck, but you get the idea, right? How do we change the model from, we can write this off as a tax deduction because it's a medical conference, to we can get the information out to the public so that it can become wider now. Oh, and by the way, this is NHANES data and they shut that down for COVID. So they won't have NHANES data for a while. Rant resumed. So I've gotten some really key sort of mindsets from some very kind people. One, Adele Height. She gave me two things. And if we can't agree on these, then we don't need to go any further in the conversation. Number one, we should be about assuring adequate essential nutrition. Number two, we should be about maintaining or restoring metabolic health, full stop. Now, I know there's a lot of topics underneath there, but if, we can't, if we're talking to somebody that can't agree on those two, stop, because we're not talking about that anymore. We're talking about something else, all right? Okay, and then I got these from Frederick Leroy. Leroy, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I don't know how to pronounce that fancy language. Um, but, I mean, he's brilliant, you should follow him. Um, and his, he's got these three keys, that animal source foods are key, I would say, essential to public health. I make the statement that animal source foods are essential for proper human development and function. Okay? Public health will be diminished if we reduce the amount of animal source foods the public has access to. Number two, so their livestock in general and ruminants in particular are essential for sustainable food systems. Okay, number three, animal source foods are part of our cultural tradition, heritages, 
you know, the sharing of food, the passing on of traditions and history and information and all of that, regardless of what the animal source foods are and where your tradition originates. Does that make sense? Right, so we're not going to send a lot of beef to India, but they do eat lamb. See, see, meat obviously is a animal source food, but not all animal source food is meat. And so my definition of the terms, subject to correction, is that you can be a vegan, no animal source food, you can be a carnivore, all animal source food, or you can be an omnivore. And a vegetarian is merely an omnivore that does not eat red meat. Now, I understand we have to have 36 different flavors, but I think that's just obscuring the reality. Okay? If you don't eat red meat, there's still plenty of animal source food that you can have as part of your diet that will provide the adequate essential nutrients that you need. Now, I do have papers that say it's probably going to be easier if you're including muscle bean as part of your diet. But, okay, you get the idea? Good. So, um, we go to this question of ecosystems. And we talk confidently about these things. And I'm reasonably certain we don't begin to understand them well enough, and maybe they're even beyond our ability to understand. A little humility might be wise. But a key thing to keep in mind is we're not going to be able to replace food production with food processing. Okay? So all of these ersatz products, the plant pucks that I refer to, they're taking some input that's arguably human edible. Again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Okay, but it was already human edible to begin with, and now you're processing it into another product. I don't know of any processing process that is 100% efficient, and you're certainly not creating more food, so you're decreasing the food supply. And of course, we haven't even begun to consider nutrient quality yet or environmental impacts yet. But this idea, I think, is key that ruminant animal agriculture increases humanity's food supply and it improves the quality of that food supply. If I feed grains, I was just having a conversation with Dr. Lehman, wheat provides like 80%, I think he said, of humanity's crude protein. Now, the figures I've remembered is that cereals, as a whole, provides more crude protein, and we'll get to that, to humanity's food supply than all animal source foods combined, and that wheat is the single largest source of crude protein in humanity's diet, and wheat sucks as a protein source. That's a technical term of description. <laughs> okay. But if I take that wheat and feed it to cattle, I will end up increasing the human edible protein supply and it will be of higher quality. Let's talk about that when we talk about the whole system. Okay. You can't be an advocate for sustainably produced foods without being an advocate for animal source foods. Again, if it were a scientific issue, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So how can we communicate this better? I, I seriously, legitimately, humbly, as I can be, <laughs> am asking for help in this. So here's one. Anybody heard something about how many more people could we feed if we weren't using all that land to feed animals? Yeah, OK. Here's an example. You could take this away. Imagine that the land surface of the Earth, not the whole Earth surface, but the land surface is a soccer field. Okay, the agricultural land wouldn't even make it to the kickoff circle. Okay, but that's agricultural land, right? The bit that we can till to produce human edible food would be within the penalty area and, not, and only to the penalty spot. The only thing we can do to produce food out here in the remainder of the agricultural land is convert plant fiber into high quality animal source food, meat and milk and fat. Well, meat is fat, right? Yeah, okay. Should have cut out the caffeine a little earlier. 
And when I showed this to a grazer in South Georgia, he said, yeah, the penalty spot's getting closer and the goalie's getting nervous because we're losing arable land. We're losing it to the development out here. So we're having, again, this urban-rural conversation and divide, and people there are talking to ranchers about how they need to... Okay. But I digest. Um, so a key concept is that you can be overfed and undernourished. Let, let's, I, I, I would like to be diet agnostic. I'm not sure I'm capable of that degree of, uh, of objectivity. But let's just say that you can eat a whole hell of a lot of processed cereal products and not get the nutrients that you need. What is it, 60 some percent of our food calories are coming from cereals, added sugars, and industrial oils? I'd say we're not well nourished. And maybe there's a relationship between the food we consume and our ingestive behavior. Maybe. I'm going to say that the existential, you know, everybody, existential crisis, 12 years to whatever, right? They said that eight years ago, but it's still 12 years. It's interesting. Um, yeah, we used to know what to do with false prophets. Um, <laughs> did I say that? Um, so the existential crisis we have is insufficient animal source food in humanity's diet. We have really, really high quality scientific evidence of human beings being harmed by too little animal source food in their diet. And I can run through those, and I have, and I'll show some presentations that I've given. Um, anything that begins to talk about harm from too much is, in my understanding, worldview, narrative, belief system, and at best, based on nutritional epidemiology. And that's the weakest quality evidence that we have. So I gave a talk at an international audience that why we need, in fact, a ruminant revolution. We need to improve the productivity and efficiency of ruminant animal agriculture globally for a number of reasons. And we could talk about them. Oh, by the way, all my slides, I've, I've posted on my social media account, I've posted single JPEGs and a PDF of all the slides, and I'm happy to share, that's why I do it. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. This is one of the slides I added. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. One of the highlights of my life was sitting at a dinner table after another keto conference. Keto Fest. The keto Fest in Connecticut, and, and and this gentleman, who I've watched grow since he first showed up. Oh, sorry, that's a, yeah, yeah. And he's like, so a lot of people don't understand that this, and, and we just heard it, which is really cool, um, but they don't understand that that term protein is crude protein. And crude protein is meaningless for the nutrition of monogastrics because we determine crude protein by determining the nitrogen percent in a sample, multiplying that number by 6.25 to create a crude protein value because we're going to assume that all the nitrogen that was in that sample was in protein and all that protein was 16% nitrogen. <laughs> so we have people spending all this time tracking macros and whatever and I'm reasonably convinced the numbers are meaningless. So how can we, you know, enlightenment, the secret of enlightenment is to lighten up, right? So how can we just like lift the burden that people have when they come in and, you know, taking the crazy out of keto, I think it was one saying that I've heard, you know, just eat meat is another one that's pretty easy. Um, so yeah, um, I gave this presentation. Uh, you can now find it. Again, there's the YouTube link, but all of these have been posted to my social media accounts. It'll link to them. You can find them. Or if you just go to YouTube and go Batterstead Protein, low carb down under will come up and you can see that. Um, this is a talk I just gave last August, Metabolic Health and Sustainability. So what is the, what is the sustainability impact of metabolic disease we've been hearing about? It. By the way, anytime somebody talks about sustainability, if they're not talking about a societal component or a, 
a group of societal components, a group of economic components, as well as a group of environmental components. You're not having an honest conversation about sustainability, right? There is no solution. There are only trade-offs. And if we're not paying attention to what we're trading off, we might make a very bad bargain, a la everybody should eat 60% calories from carbohydrates and eat lots of industrial oils and whatever, 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 despite evidence at the time saying that might not be a good idea. Right? These are complex systems and people want to over... Okay, so you can find that one. This is one that I gave. Why did I go backwards? I don't know. Same thing. Um, The American healthcare industry is it has been stated in one paper to be a significant source of pollution and including 10% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the US. Uh, for a review, beef is 2%. 2, 10, 2, 10. <laughs> and oh, by the way, beef is part of an industry that's currently sequestering 12% of US greenhouse gas emissions. It's the only industry doing it at scale. So we're having these conversations about sustainable health care. They're not real conversations. Oh, by the way, let's assume, let's speculate wildly. Let's, let's assume that you could take a diabetic off, the, the two, type 2 diabetic off their medications. Let's just, you know, blue sky or something. So if we could take a average adult American with type 2 diabetes and get them off their medications, they would lower their carbon footprint 29% more than if they shifted from a high meat to a vegan diet. Let's talk about, it's not, we're not having an honest conversation, I can assure you of it, but we have to answer the questions, right? So, and oh, by the way, I, I think that that diet would be sustainable, wouldn't you? You can stay on a high meat diet. The growth in the vegan diet, dieters are always the new ones. They're not real good at telling you the net. <laughs> so here you go. Sometimes, you know, I so miss Adele's snark. Um, she really was brilliant. Um, uh, this wasn't from her. I think I originally saw this from Sean Baker. Um, but, you know, the law is if you see something you like, you use it the first three times, you give credit, after that it's yours. Yeah. So I've used this a lot. So, um, so again, uh, all of that U.S. animal agriculture is 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. Beef is 2%. U.S. healthcare, 10%. Another friend of ours made the comment of, here we have a, a picture of a bunch of rapacious butchers and some nice folks from the meat industry. <laughs> Did I say something? Um, so here we go with the greenhouse gas footprint. So a key message, I, and I don't know why this doesn't have more traction, but what is it about people that lets them diminish the value of their own health below these you know, projections, these models from what's going to happen in 2100. I mean, if you've got somebody that's coming to you presenting with type 2 diabetes, you can tell them about the increased likelihood of amputation within a very foreseeable time frame. I'd like to die with all the toes I was born with. <laughs> Call me crazy. And how, what, what, what is it about that that just doesn't have traction? Um, so yeah, I want to encourage people. You know, we have a lot of people that are really focused on, you know, changing the world and changing other people. And it's been my experience that those people are doing that to distract themselves from doing the hard, humbling work of changing themselves. How do we have that conversation? I mean, because the irony, of course, is if we would all change ourselves, and, you know, we would improve the world, right? We all got stuff we can work on. Right? I, I certainly know I do. Um, so social media presence, um, pretty much out there. 
Uh, you find Ballerstead, it's likely to be me, <laughs> or I'll show up in the list. Um, and then this I want to leave up for a while, and then the next slide, and then I want to kind of get some input. Um, I think one of the arguments against the narrative is to tell people how bad it is in low and middle income countries. In other words, I want to shame them. You are an eco-imperialist in the modern era. You are going to people in other parts of the world and saying, you know, my little brother, I know better than you how to develop your resources and how to develop your society. And maybe we do have information that needs to be transferred, but it probably ought to be in a more respectful conversation than that. And these narratives are impacting and restricting funding that's available for people to do the development that they need to. If you go to that, several of my talks, I've, I've gotten really aware that between a fifth and a quarter of children under five years old are stunted due to a lack of the essential nutrients best provided by animal source foods. The, the WHO even says that children six to 24 months of age, meat, eggs, dairy, and seafood are the best sources of the essential nutrients that they need to develop properly. And then UNICEF says that 59% of children, 6 to 24 months of age, don't get meat, eggs, dairy, seafood. This is a shame. This is a scandal. We can and must do better. People say, can we feed the world? No, no, change it. We must feed the world. We must find a way for us, humanity, not U.S. alone, but humanity to produce sufficient animal source foods to meet humanity's needs. Here's another example of the change in mindset. If people start talking about how we have to do something about population growth, understand that the best numbers, and they're only projections, but that's all we're dealing with at this point, is that by 2100, when we have 2 billion more people, whatever that number is, we're going to have the same number of children 15 and under as we have today. Now, it's been my experience, most people think that doing something about population growth is aimed at birth control. What in fact they're saying is they need to limit the number of Africans and Indians that can live to be 70 or 80. I don't think that's what they mean, but let's find out, shall we? And please stop saying that. Okay. So, Animal Frontiers, this was an entire uh, edition Foods of Animal Origin, A Prescription for Global Health, lots of great uh, papers in that. And you can download the PDF, dietdoctor.com. We know about Clear Center at UC Davis if you want information on methane and emissions from animal agriculture. This is a go-to place. Frank Mitlerner uh, is the principal scientist. Animal Source Foods in Ethical, Sustainable, and Healthy Diets a dynamic white paper. This is a blog uh, spot site, um, and, and uh, Frederick Lavoie is one of the drivers of this. Remarkably current, um, and it's like two dozen or so people contributing as authors to this effort. And the white paper is, you know, here are the many layers of links, so you can just explore to your heart's content. Um, meet, moth, <laughs> meet Myth Crushers, is a publication of the American Meat Institute, so it's an industry publication, but they do try to cover a number of topics and they give you some uh, citations that you can go back and learn more about. Um, and then the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, they have a booth out here, uh, most of us are familiar, um, but then I point people to the clinical guidelines for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction because that's a great literature review and you can download that and, I found that to be very helpful. Uh, last thing up, and that is this uh, reading list that I have. It's, it's something I put together on Amazon. I have no commercial thing there. It's just the easiest way I could figure to say, well, this book is interesting, and put it up and then sort it. So this is stuff off my uh, book bookcase, and uh, it covers a range of topics, things that interest me. 
Uh, so that may give you a more perspective on me, but um, I did try to sort them in importance. So I think um, Ben Bickman's book is the top one, I think. But you'll find all the books that I found to be helpful there. So with that, I think I'm done. Um, I have no idea where we are with time. I thank you for coming. I thank you for your patience. And I got nowhere else to go. So.